Hello, everybody. Happy Monday to you. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Thank you so much for joining the program today. You are listening to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 FM. I'm Kathy Holmes. I'm super glad to be your host. And today on the program, we're going to talk about inner revolution. You know, that wonderful feeling we have when we feel good in our bodies and in our minds. Our guest today, Kathy Skelcher, owns a company actually called Inner Revolution Coaching and Yoga, and we're super glad to have her on the program. Thank you for being here, Kathy. How are you today? Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm good. Really good. The sun is shining today, so I'm feeling a little bit better these winter times. You know, it's it's always better when we're feeling better about the weather, no matter what it is. And I know in the last little while, we've seen a lot of challenges with the up and down and the cold. We're coming into winter. We're starting to feel that. There's a lot to unpack in your, in the things that you do to feel good. Does weather have ever anything to do with that? Uh, well, I can certainly speak for myself. Yes, it does. <laughs> I have to really, really like dial into self-care and making sure I'm doing things to not just manage my emotions and my mood, but actually like support it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I totally understand it. And it's, it's easier than we think to do it, but most people don't take the time. They, a lot of people still in this day and age believe that self-care is actually being quite selfish, but we know that mm -hmm. if you don't look after yourself, then it's impossible to be able to look after the ones we love in our lives. So what, what brought you to this work? What made you decide, I really want to focus on that part of life? Yeah. Um, well, I was working for the federal government of Canada, Fisheries and Oceans. Here in Nanaimo, there's a big center. Mm -hmm. And um, I had been there for, oh gosh, 18 years, I think. Oh, well, that's a while. Yeah. And I was working in science um, and working for, you know, feds. It's like, it's the whim of who's in at the time. So it was a bit of a roller coaster over those 18 years. And at some point, like, I was really happy to be using my degree. I was really happy to be, you know, I'm an educated woman doing the thing I was trained to do. And at some point, I realized that I didn't love the work. It wasn't that I wasn't going into work and doing it and doing it well, and I wanted to do it well. It's just, you know, I really started to feel like I was punching the clock. And I remember sitting with my mother-in-law actually on our couch in the living room one night and just sort of thinking like, oh, I just don't know if this is what I want to be doing. But, you know, I had a pension, I had benefits. I, you know, like it was, it was a hard job to leave. And she sort of said to me, she's like, have you ever thought about going into life coaching? And I thought about going into counseling before, mm -hmm. um, but I felt like it, it sort of has a past feel to me. You're sort of digging into things in history Understood. and yeah. coaching has a real forward looking view. And I really like that. Mm -hmm. And I realized that in my life, a lot of people came to me, felt comfortable talking to me. Um, my husband always says like my superpower is crying. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a crier. And That's hilarious. I, always, I have to say. <laughs> right? And I thought it was a real weakness and he just said, he's like, no, because then people feel comfortable to be vulnerable in front of you. And so uh, it was almost like that week, I just went through this, like, you know, um, just real, uh, I don't know, inner tumultuous time where I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I decided I would, I would do a health coaching course. And so I, you know, pulled some investments out to pay for it and off I went. Yeah. So that's sort of how I got there. And that was only uh, five years ago. Five, oh, six so years ago is, now. Yeah. yeah. Meta metamorphosis change has yeah. happened for you on a multitude yeah. of levels. And I agree with you. It must be very hard to leave the security of that, you know, the job that's predictable, the things that you know, the pension, those kind of jobs are hard to find. So it was a real mm. piece of courage in you to actually walk your own talk walking ahead yeah it was really scary yeah. and I think you know when when I came up with the name for my business in a revolution I was literally like laying awake for the, how many number of nights thinking about this change that was coming in my life and 
the word revolution really resonated with me because revolutions are not quiet. No, they are, they not. are not peaceful. They are not simple. They're not easy. And I felt like that's what I was having was some sort of like inner revolt <laughs> to try to transform something. And when I thought of the name, like it just sort of came to me, like I said, in the middle of the night. And at that time I would like wake up, run to the kitchen and write something down. <laughs> and um, that's where it came from because I was just like, oh, this is what this is. This like feeling of, you know, upset and doubt and fear and excitement and creativity all wrapped into one. Yes. And it just felt like it felt like a revolution. Something was about to change. What were some of your greatest teachings within that revolutionary process? Mm, what were my greatest teachings? I always feel like most of my lessons are done in really hard times. You know, I, you don't learn a lot when things are going smoothly. Exactly. I like enjoy the ride while it's happening. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> but I it's like, you. there's not a lot of lessons. And so I think it was like, you know, I, I really noticed that when I started going through it and I left that work, mm -hmm. I started having other women, especially reach out to me and be like, you know, how did you come to this decision? How did you come to this decision? So one of the lessons was sort of, um, once it happened for me, it became this possibility for other people and to share how challenging it was, you know, yes. to not try to sugarcoat it, to not be like, oh yeah, it was a simple decision. No problem. You know, um, and just share that story with other people, I think was really valuable for myself to be able to articulate it and be able to yeah. look back and share it and figure out exactly what had happened for myself for and sure. do that in a place where I was being witnessed and I could witness others. I, I love how you use the word witness because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when we are celebrating self and we're able to see it in other people's eyes, we are in fact witnessing a great transformation in all of us and each and every one of us uh, as people. Mm -hmm. There's a, a depth of growth and, and that part for me is always exciting when I talk with people that are doing your kind of work where, where you're kind of getting in the nitty gritty and the best way to be there is to know that you've done it as well. So mm -hmm. was it an easy process for you to kind of walk down this path? Did you find yourself in, you know, with obstacle or like, how did it, how did it roll? <laughs> um, I'm giggling. It's like, I have this thing where it's like, once I make the decision, I'm usually pretty good, yeah. right? Like once I'm there, I'm like, okay, I've made the decision. I put the money down. This yeah. is what I'm doing. I focus, I can get it done. No problem. Uh -huh. Yeah. The hard part was making the decision. You know, it was deciding to leave, you know, and I had people in my life that were really supportive and excited. And, um, you know, my partner, Kevin, he was just like, he's like, yeah, that's what you're doing. He's like, great, go out, get after it, you know? And this is like, I mean, he's like, you know, I decided I was a jeweler once and then I, you know, I'm constantly doing something and he's like, okay, now you're a jeweler. Good job. You know? So I had lots of support in some areas of my life. And then I had a lot of people who were just like, what are you doing? You know, like, you know, my mother, I love my mom and she was so scared for me. You know, she was just looking at me. She's like, what are you doing? You're giving up your security generationally. That was like crazy. She's like, what are you doing? You went to university, yes. you have an yes. education, you're getting paid that way. And, you know, and so it was really scary for her. And I had a lot of people at work that were just like, this is the flakiest thing that I've ever heard of. Like, you're going to quit your job and go open a yoga and a life coaching business. Like, you know, they were just chuckling at me, you know, and, and so it did like create a lot of doubt. Of course. Um, but I just sort of had to, I had to really recognize that I didn't think I could do another 15 years there or 20 yes. years there. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I can't just keep coming in and punching the clock. And of course, like, this happened when I was in my early forties, which is, you know, that's the time it's, you know, you start yeah. really yearning for purpose, you know, yeah. you start questioning what you're doing. And so for me, that's sort of, I had to really keep my eye on why I was doing it yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. and how I felt like, yeah, it was about how I felt, you know, oh, for it sure. wasn't maybe the most pragmatic decision, but it felt really, really right. And I, I love that. It's that it feels really, really right. I think that people, 
you know, in all fairness, I also come from that time when, you know, you just don't give up security because security is hard to come by. But in Mm. this day and age, there's no such thing as security anymore. Um, I love that women are much more empowered than they were in my mother's time and your mother's time, probably like we mm-hmm. have a different way of viewing the world. We're more at, I'm, sounds terrible, but respectfully, we are more educated than we've ever been. More women are rising in higher pillars of the world. So, you know, and none of that happens without listening to your gut. It sounds like to me that that's what was happening for you is that you were listening to your gut and rather than shy away from it, it took a lot of courage for you to go, I want to do this. So when you're talking to your clients, I can only imagine that you're probably trying to find that piece of courage in them. Is that true? Yeah, I think it's kind of the perfect segue. It's like for the first few years of my business, um, you know, I was struggling. I was like, you know, I had a pretty good yoga following. I've been in the fitness industry for, you know, uh, 20 years by that time. Right. So I had a pretty good yoga following, but the coaching was really challenging. Sure. And so I was, you know, I think this is a very common entrepreneurial story is you're just taking clients. You're like saying yes to anyone, even yes, if you absolutely. don't think it's like the best fit. <laughs> yeah. And so I was doing that. Yeah. And I've actually, so recently Um, Just this year, actually, I've experienced this huge shift in my work. And I am exclusively coaching women now. Mm -hmm. And um, I have now sort of put the banner on my business as women's health coaching. And this, I think, is the part that you're asking. You're like, oh, is this what you try to pull out in your clients? And it's like, yeah, it's really hard for me to relate to men. And not because I don't have them in my life. And of course not. It's just different. You know? Yeah, like dad experience is different than mom experience. Yeah. Woman in the workplace is different than men in the workplace. Absolutely. And yeah, and so it just started to feel misaligned, you know. Um, and then I think it was like, you know, I wasn't showing up at my best either. So I had this massive shift, like I said, at the beginning of this year. And in part, again, because I learned something for myself that I wanted to shout from the rooftop. So, you know, we tend to teach what we're learning ourselves. Uh, Yes. Yeah. So exactly. When I was first in my coaching business, that's exactly what it was doing is like trying to have women really not just listen to their gut, but hear it to know that it's there. You know, I think so many of us are going through our daily schedule and you know if you are caretaking for anyone whether it be a parent or a child or you know if you have a partner if you have family extended family if you have a job like all of these things you know sometimes we lose connection with that so luckily with the yoga piece you know i feel like there's a bit of that embodied practice pulled into the cerebral practice of you know getting after things goal setting all of those things, it's it's a bit of a mix. I really resonate with what you're saying. And I'm also uh, curious from the perspective of when you made the transition and you made that, you know, period of time, you were doing it during COVID. So how were you able to relate during, I mean, the world was changing Mm -hmm. the pandemic for the last almost two years now has yeah. really shifted the way that we can be together. So how is that manifested yeah. in the work you're doing, not only for your company, but for your self-growth in becoming a better coach? Mm-hmm. COVID was tough. Like I had a physical yoga studio, which I'm sitting in now. And, you know, that got shut down a few times, um, especially at the beginning, which at first it was just like switched online, you know, like just keep people coming. And then people got pretty zoomed out and, didn't want to be doing that. And so, um, you know, I was just, it was actually, it was was the best of times, the worst of times. It was like, I hear that a lot actually. Right. It was just like (laughs) these times that were really challenging. And it was also, I think a good kickstart for me in becoming more creative. Sure. So, you know, then I was allowed to hold outdoor classes, but not indoor classes. So then we like cleared off the patio and we're having outdoor classes. And then it was like, I could have two people come into a class. So I created the friendship sessions and that kind of thing. And the coaching, um, you know, all of it had to go online. And so luckily, if it's one on one, I have a much easier time with online stuff. So I have clients that are 
outside of Nanaimo and outside of Canada even. And so I had been doing online coaching anyway. So anyone that I was seeing face to face, if it was a night day, we could meet outside. Yes. And if it was not, then we were online. And, you know, I found it, it was really important to hold the same kind of space online that you do in person. Sure. So, you know, it was a learning curve that way as well. Um, but COVID, I think now coming, I shouldn't even say coming out of it, that's not quite accurate, but yeah, at this right. point yeah, in it, yeah, it's like people are really excited to get back to doing things and seeing humans that they don't live in the same house with. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yoga sure. has been, you know, people are excited to come again and that feels really great. And the coaching side, I think um, in the spring, like I was saying, I sort of had this transformation with my own health. And then this September, I held what was called a six week fall gut reset in under the banner of women's health coaching. And it was so successful. It was so exciting. I loved it. It felt creative and it was all online. And, um, you know, people loved coming to Zoom and being in like little Zoom rooms with each other and getting to know who they were um, going through the program with. And it actually, I think, has sort of opened up my opportunity and allowed a lot of people who have a hard time making the time to come, to drive, to attend an event, to drive home, maybe arrange for childcare, um, you know, make whatever arrangements they need to. Yeah, It's actually opened it up and made it a little bit more possible for people. So it's been, I think now <laughs> I can say, oh, there's been some positive effects. You know, there's something to be said for resilience, right? It's for bouncing about and yeah. learning how we can be better. Um, if you have just tuned in, ladies and gents, I'm super glad that you did. Uh, today on Act 3, we are super glad you have come to have a listen or to watch us on YouTube. Kathy Skelcher with Inner Revelation is with us. She uh, Inner Revolution. Inner, sorry, Inner Revolution. I wrote it down. <laughs> okay. I was thinking about the revelations that I was having as I was talking to you. It, it kind of came through instead of it being the other way. So Inner Revolution. Um, and so if you just tuned in, please... Um, uh, welcome us here. Just as a reminder to everyone, this is being recorded by Zoom. So for our fabulous Chile listeners and local listeners, sometimes the internet can be a little bit unstable. And so there may be some feedback coming on or anything like that that's happening or an echo. Please, that's part of the joyful Zoom experience. Again, a part of the resilience factor that we've been talking about here. And so please uh, uh, bear with us and enjoy the program at any rate. So Kathy, I, I want to dig into and do a little bit more of a deep dive from a resilience factor, because mm. what I'm hearing for women, a lot of women, is that many, many, many women want to do something. They have the goal to do something in their mind, but there's always that fear factor. There's mm. always that, should I, shouldn't I, should yeah. I, shouldn't I? You know, coming from yeah. yourself, like there, there had to have been a, a for lack of, I'm not Oprah. Uh, so there, <laughs> but there had to be that aha kind of moment where you just decided, that's it. This is just the way it's going to be. I'm making a tough decision. I've done my due diligence, mm -hmm. but it wasn't easy, was it? In the beginning. Yeah, in the beginning, it wasn't. And I think um, the, the question about resiliency that gets me pretty excited is like, most of us need a little help, yes. right? So it's like the thing that I talk to people about is like building your village. You want to start building your village while things are going well. Yes. You want to like, you know, I have like a marriage counselor. I have a parenting counselor. I've got like physical health people that keep my body moving. Um, I have a meditation mentor, you know, all of these things. I have an Enneagram teacher, you know, like all of these things were in place for times when I sort of hit crisis in my life yes. or my family had crisis or whatever was going on in our bubble. Yeah. And I think this is the piece about resilience is, I don't wanna use the word complacency, but we become like, this is the thing about when things are going great. And I always say like, if things are going great, leave it, like have a good time, enjoy it. Something's gonna come down the road. You know, there'll be a bump. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like catastrophic, but there'll be a bump, you know? Yeah. And so one of the things that I think about as coaching is like part of a village, you know, like you have your girlfriends that you call, 
you have your coach you call, you have your counselor that you call, you have your doctor that you call, your acupuncture, whoever it is. It's just like, it's just part of the village. And yeah. building that in good times, I think is a recipe for success and resiliency when you hit a bump. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But do you think that most women have you seen in your practice, are most people actually building those villages or are they mm. putting those, putting that off a little bit? I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to look for the negative and all of this, but, it, but from an awareness factor, I think that there's a lot of women that just, they will put themselves last. Their kids are more important. Their husband's more important. Their job is more important. Like something else is always mm-hmm. far more important. And I'm sure that this echoes with a lot of people. Absolutely. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about coaching women exclusively now. Yes. I'm like, these are the people that need a cheerleader, you know, like um, my daughter just turned 18 and left home. She's going to college now. Right. It was like, I'm sorry. I've got a 30 year old and it's heartbreaking. It's like, oh my God, my baby. (laughs) Yeah. And I have like four four teenagers. Right. So I'm like, I thought the first one to hit the road and I would be like high-fiving people and celebrating. And I'm yeah. so sad. Yeah. However, now that there's been a bit of time, I, I realized even for myself, I always thought, you know, like I had my own business. I always taught like aerobics or yoga or something on the side. I worked like, I didn't think I had given things up, but what I realized now is I have so much time. I'm like, Whoa, like we have one that's um, at college and one that's at boarding school. And so I'm down to like, you know, half the kids yeah. and I'm like, Whoa, like I have so much time in my day. So absolutely. Like, and I think the thing is like, are women building their villages? This is the question. And I think that unconsciously we do it because yeah. we do have our, you know, family members that we feel comfortable calling. We have our friends that are close that we call when we're having a hard time, that kind of thing. So I think we do have it. I think the difference is building it really consciously. Yes. So, you know, like most of us have these things in place, but really building it consciously so that we know that we're supported. Yes. You know, sometimes we hit a bump and it's like, oh gosh, like I'm alone. I'm, yeah. I'm not supported. I feel like I'm the only person going through this. Yeah. And generally we're going through the same things or some version of the same things it's on a spectrum, you know? Um, but I think it's, if you're consciously building that, I think that's the, that's the difference. It's like, most of us have a village, but it may not be a consciously created village. Do you think that COVID actually changed the village dynamic or bettered it? I think, I, I think that it's so hard to say like, as an intro, I'm fairly introverted. Mm-hmm. So COVID was like really quite nice for me. <laughs> I was like, oh, good. Like we don't have to have people in the house all the time. We don't have to go visiting it all the time. And it's not that I don't mind doing those things, but my partner is like an extrovert. So he had a much harder time in COVID than I did. So in some ways, I think it like made our world small for a period of time, especially during lockdown. That was, I think, a painful period for everybody. And even if you, I didn't notice it during it, now that things are opening up a bit again, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, like this feels good. However, I think that we had to, you know, we, I hear people talking about this all the time about like, oh, working from home. You know, we may never go back to requiring people to be in an office 100% of the time. We, our expectation has changed. You know, even for a yoga class, some people are like, oh, I used to have to go to a yoga class in person or do a recorded one from some other website, you know? And so now the options are greater. You can still feel like you're a part of a community, even if you're online or if it's a mix of online and in-person. So I think that part, it has really changed. And for myself, I don't know that I would go back to the way that I operated pre-COVID either. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I don't think I will personally. And I, I know most of the women that, you know, are part of my tribe are the same. It's, it's a matter of, of it, from what I've seen anywhere, at least in my experiences, I can't speak for other people, but in my experiences, you're quite right. It's uh, uh, if you're an introverted person, it was almost a blessing. If you're an extroverted person, it was a little bit of a harder run. Or if you're there anywhere in between in that spectrum, 
Um, but it's also about managing expectations and managing expectations yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So how are you finding when you're working with people, regardless whether it's in a coaching dynamic or whether it's on the yoga dynamic or it's in the transition uh, period of what, what do I want to be? Who do I want to be when I grow up? Um, how, how are you kind of finding the managing expectations, not only for yourself, but for other people? Yeah, I think that I think that the expectation, like the working side of it, people like my clients have been so patient. Yeah. You know, like if something goes silent, like, like you're talking about, we're on Zoom, there might be glitches in the audio, whatever is happening. It's like people have been, I think it's actually increased people's patience with yes. this kind of thing. I think for me, it's helped me let go of what the perfect, you know, service to deliver looks like or yes. the perfect, um, you know, recording looks like, you know, people are just, they're just, happy to be together and doing things again and like I said you know I'll get a message after a class or during a coaching thing where you know my internet bonks out and yeah. people are like oh it's okay and I'm like, okay where were we you know like which can <laughs> exactly. be really disruptive in a coaching setting and they're like okay regroup yeah. where were we let's keep going so I think people have been really forgiving and really patient actually in my experience yeah in mind, yeah. too, I think people have been really, really tolerant of so many things they might have otherwise been frustrated. And in all fairness, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had this technology to even have these conversations yeah. on Zoom. Even if it did exist, it certainly wasn't widely, you know, used or widely spread. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we have yeah. seen a lot of roses come through with a few thorns for sure, but a lot of roses mm -hmm. have come out of this. Are you, um, as you, as you're progressing in this, are you seeing the changes happening in people relatively quickly, or do you think it's individual or like, what, what, what might, I, if, for example, if say I was to call you or anyone who's listening right now is to give you a phone yeah. call, by the way, a perfect segue to remind people to go grab a piece of paper and a pen That's so right. you can write down Kathy Sketcher's <laughs> information because you're going to want to reach out and have a conversation, right? So at the end of the day, that, that's the good segue there, but back to the, the question, yeah. which is, you know, like, I have you, it, it, like, what might it look like if someone it gives you a call and says, um, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba, I'm calling, that's the courage right there. Mm -hmm. What next? Yeah, what next? Yeah. So generally, if somebody calls me, you know, I'll set aside like 20 minutes, half an hour just to talk to one another, kind of like you and I are talking to each other to see if it feels like a good fit. Yes. You know, like I don't want somebody to have to pay $100 to figure out if I'm the wrong coach for them, Absolutely. you know. So that's sort of the first thing is the first call is just like getting to know each other, getting like sort of a, you know, surface idea of what's going on for the person or what made them pick up the call, mm -hmm. um, pick up to call. Mm -hmm. And then after that, if it's one-on-one -on -one coaching, it's a 12 week program. And so when you ask me this question, you're like, what does it look like? I was thinking about the coaching trajectory. So in a 12 week program, it's like, people are super excited at first. It's kind of like a workout program, right? Like they're yeah. really excited. They're doo -doo -doo -doo. And around week five to week eight, they hate me. <laughs> it's like, literally I'm like oh it's week six yes this is the time that I'm a terrible human <laughs> it's my fault Completely so understand. There's, I do. Yeah, I hear you. there's a breakdown you know like and mm -hmm. I think this is the thing it's the revolution piece of it it's like it it isn't going to be this like upward you know linear trajectory from zero to 12 weeks it's yeah. like there's going to be like oh I'm pushing up against something yeah that I've been pushing yeah. up against for a long time yeah. you know you can sort of get away with it for the first like four or five weeks and then the resistance comes in and if people stick with it, it's like by 12 weeks, it's good. You know, like, and it usually just takes like a week or two to yeah. push through this stuff and figure out what's going on. Um, I always say, I like, I am a, I am a softy person, but in coaching, I always have to remember to have a bit of a thicker skin and know that it's not about me. So it's my, it's my job to hold space for people to have breakdown and to have it be safe. You yes. know, that a lot of people, they get into breakdown, they get into sadness, they get into yes. anger, they get into frustration, they resentment, and there's never been a safe container for them to express those feelings. So it's my job, you know, yeah. to hold that safe container for that time until they break through it. And that's what transforms it is having some different experience than you've had before. 
Um, so that's sort of the, you know, how long does it take? I usually ask people to stay for three months, to stick to it for three months. Um, you know, some, some of the best programs are that way in the, in the fact that, you know, if you really want a revolution, then mm -hmm. you have to push through the pain. And for a lot mm -hmm. of people, the growing pain can be really daunting and nobody wants yeah. to be pain. Nobody wants to feel crappy. Nobody wants to really look at in the mirror mm -hmm. and see what's really going on and dig deep. And mm -hmm. until you do, then a revolution can't truly happen, can it? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I think even like in a six week program, you know, I just ran one in September and we had 21 women involved and inevitably there's like a couple of people that just ghost, right? They're just like, you know, not responding to things, you know, and it's my job to keep, to keep asking, to keep touching it, even if there's no response. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we had people that had amazing results in a six week period. For sure. Um, you know, just like turning around their health, like one woman quit smoking for the entire duration of it. She still is, you know, like, and just change in energy levels, change in hormonal health, like all of these things that women struggle with. And we just sort of think are, you know, in my experience, um, it was like, I wasn't getting a lot of guidance from my health practitioners. You know, I was experiencing perimenopause. Mm. And so it's just like, Oh well, you're in that time of your life. Like, there's nothing to do, yes. right? Yeah, the whole dismissive <laughs> part makes me crazy. The healthcare system mm. is broken on so many levels, and we yeah. still are fighting to say this is not an imaginary feeling. Our hormones are changing, and they sometimes wreak havoc on so much. Oh yeah, that we do, and not just during perimenopause. I mean, oh, any any time and all the time, oh, right? Throughout your whole life, and so I think the thing, like for me is like really honoring that we are these like hormonal beings, like, yes. and that's okay. Yeah. Um, and supporting women through that and really validating them. Like when we were talking about being seen and being heard, it's like, yeah, that is a big, big part of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like, you know, however, however long the question starts, do you see results quickly? Um, and generally if people are willing to do the work, it happens fast. It's, you know, I see people for three months and then maybe they're done. I have people that I see for three months and then they continue and I see them every two weeks instead of every week or every month, you know, we do a touch in. Um, so there's all kinds of, you know, varieties of things, but yeah. When we talk about expectations and how things work mm -hmm. for people, I mean, everyone is so very, very different, but we do all have a few things that are really in common as women. You know, we mm -hmm. don't like pain. We don't want to face the stuff we don't want to face, no matter how enlightened we are, no matter how spiritual <laughs> we are, no matter how awake we are. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to rip off a bandaid in a really quick way because they, it, there's going to be pain involved. In, but, mm -hmm. but pain doesn't necessarily have to be bad. Pain actually has a purpose. No. transition has absolutely so you know yeah. I, how, how when when someone comes to you and they're like mm -hmm. oh, I am just so done I am like I'm just yeah. so done right <laughs> whether they're yeah. where, whether it's because they're in the middle of their stuff or whether it's because they're starting off and saying I want to change and maybe they're not really clear that that's what they really want or they're in a bit mm -hmm. of denial you know, what kind of tools do you use with people uh, or, or, or oh, tools is probably the wrong word, but you know, I like you, tools. It's fine. Yeah. How do, you, how do you facilitate that, that challenged person who's just said, I am so done. I am so mm -hmm. done. Yeah. I think a girlfriend and I have this phrase where we're just like, okay, universe, I'm ready for a day off. Like, just leave me alone, you know? <laughs> And you're just, you're yes. done. You're just tired. You're like, I just want to like yeah. have nobody need anything from me for 24 yeah. hours, you know? Um, and aside from that, I think like one of the biggest things in coaching is just the reframe. It's like, you know, as you're talking about pain and how things are painful and ripping off the bandaid and all of the like analogies even are like, you know, they're painful. It's like, I find any time that I'm resistant to something yep. is probably what I need to go towards. So Absolutely. if we can start seeing things that are painful as either like a red flag or even better, like, you know, an invitation, it's like, oh man, I feel super resistant to this or mine is resentment. Like if I start resenting somebody, <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, like this is, this is one of my signs that I'm actually 
sacrificing my own boundaries, you know? So it's like starting to point out these patterns in people and they're different for everyone that are just real signals that it's not actually what's going on out here. It's what's going on in here. And I think that's one of the most sort of profound things. It doesn't sound like a really concrete, um, you know, tool or exercise, but it's something that when I'm listening to people speak, it's like, that's what I'm listening for is those patterns is those reoccurring things in different areas of their life. Absolutely. Right. That the perception is the same. So I'd say that's sort of the biggest one. And I also think that sometimes people, um, people, what they feel inside isn't necessarily always what they project outside and vice versa. Right. I think that sometimes people see each other in two different frames. So what, you know, for, for listeners who have known me for a very long time or have been paying attention to the show for a long time, they know for the last couple of years, I've been unwell, right? So for two and a half years, okay. I fought a very serious illness. Thanks be to God, I am safe and sound and working through it and finally on the road to recovery again. But I've had it for 35 years. And so when it wakes up, it shines its its head. Many of our listeners have gone through all kinds of mental, physical, emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. This world, you do not get through this world without having a scratch here or there. So reframing is really, really important. And setting mm-hmm. clear and understood boundaries you know you were saying yeah. how when you're triggered you might be triggered and you didn't use that word so forgive me for putting it no there. that's okay uh, mm-hmm. but you know you're triggered if you're feeling a little bit of resentment it, it's a sign that says let me listen a little bit more it's time to hear yeah. for some people it's letting go right i'm just getting too invested mm-hmm. in that situation i need to step back and take another look yep. For other people, it might be feeling that they're just simply overwhelmed. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's yeah. really important that people recognize that these are these feelings, these situations, these boundaries, when things get tested, it's an opportunity for change. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I know I'm not allowed to curse on this show, but my coach, she calls it, I will not, I promise. <laughs> and she calls it, go ahead. No, no. I was going to say it's, it's, it's okay from a curse perspective when we know the context of it. It's okay. Thankfully we're talking on community radio. So we're all good. Okay. So she was talking about opportunity for growth and she calls them, um, a fogs and it's another opportunity for growth. Exactly. And so it's not always that you're embracing it and you're excited about it. But yeah, that's exactly what it is. And the other thing as I was listening to some of your story is Mm -hmm. it's also really important to acknowledge that sometimes things just are hard. hard. They are hard. They are sad. Yeah. You know, and I find, especially being in like the yoga and coaching community, there's a lot of um, toxic positivity where it's like, just look through the silver lining and everything. And it's like, yeah, okay, I'll do that tomorrow. Like, but right now, today, like, I am angry about this. You know, I have been dealing with this for a long time and it's coming up again and I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. And it's like, yeah, that completely makes sense, you know, and having somebody's feelings be validated. And like you say, not being able to sink into the muck of it or experiencing some kind of, you know, spiral. I've, I've experienced clinical depression before in my life. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, now I know the signs of it. So, you know, I have to be careful even when we started talking about the weather. <laughs> like it's oh, all sure. related. For some people, yeah. it's sad, right? That, that's, yeah. that weather change will trigger all kinds of things. That's right. Yeah. I, I just really want to go back to something that you said that I want to break mm-hmm. open a little bit because one of the things I love about having this show is talking to real people going through real life situations and understanding sometimes that things that we thought were okay all our lives are not always okay. And it's oh, yeah. okay to break open those, but you have a wonderful mm-hmm. way of saying toxic positivity right? Mm. I was recently, I was with some friends and like, everybody's just trying to be oh so happy. And it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm known to be a bit of a cheerleader, right? So, you know, I'm out there going, let's go, let's go, rah, rah, rah. Yeah. There are days when I just want to put those damn pom-poms down and they're too heavy to carry for a little while. So Mm -hmm. giving yourself permission to, for those people that keep on saying, I have to be this, or I have to be that actually, 
that's what's causing so much of the pain is you don't have to be anything to anybody. Mm-hmm. Some days it's okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, that that's a real big contributor to burnout. It is. And women is like, I have to be all of these things all of the time. There's no, you know, and we have this story that, you know, and I would say is true or not true on a spectrum, right? Like some of us have very supportive partners. Some of us do not have partners. Some of us have supportive family. Some of us don't have family either close or at all. And so, you know, I think that, like one thing I was saying, you know, when it's gray and miserable and raining out, I'm like, okay, I'm going to give myself permission to stay inside today. You yes. know, like that's okay. And Brené Brown has this great thing about writing permission slips for yourself to actually like write it down and say like, I'm giving myself permission to, you know, stay under my duvet for one day, you know, that's it tomorrow. I'll get up and I'll start again. And you know, like talking to people about health, it's like, yeah, it's okay to give yourself permission to, you know, have pizza and a beer. And then tomorrow is day one again, you know, and I think I definitely do not want anyone listening to this to think that I have like this perfect life because I do not, you know, Um, I have a blended family, we have exes on both sides, we have like, you know, in-laws, we have all of these challenges, my husband traveled for work so much when we first met each other. And, you know, we both have our own stuff. We have all of our human history and baggage and trauma, you know, where you're talking about trauma. You know, I don't think anybody does not have trauma. And again, it's a spectrum, but trying to deny that we have it also is not helpful. So yeah, yeah, so I think it's just, yeah, the permission slip, I think is really important. I love Renee Brown anyway. And I think that, you know, um, I think that she's opened a lot of doors for people to feel more comfortable with their vulnerability. Um, Giving ourselves permission is actually a gift. It's not something Mm -hmm. that we should be stingy with. Right. Yeah. You know, know, there's a difference between, as you say, I love the word spectrum. You've used the word spectrum several times in our dialogue today. Mm. The spectrum is there's extreme one and extreme the other, but life is not extreme on either perspective. It's usually in the gray area, depending on what Mm. the situation is at the time of our life. Even things that are horrifically difficult in one period, once you've gone through the storm, gone through the difficulty, when you come back and you realize, oh my gosh, I've gone through that. Mm-hmm. That new sense of strength and empowerment and yeah. energy. I mean, all of that stuff can be realized again, but, mm-hmm. but just sitting by, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are afraid to take that risk. What mm-hmm. do you say to those people? Yeah. I think the thing that I really hear from people is like this idea of feeling stuck, yeah. you know, like you just feel stuck and yeah. You know, I, I've been there. I felt stuck where, and you know, when I'm back to the like reframing, whenever I feel like there's option A or option B, mm-hmm. I can either do this, like somebody else wants me to, or I can do what I want to, you know, but either way, somebody's going to be unhappy. You know, if I get into that kind of mindset where it's just so black and white, I know I'm in trouble. You know, yeah. I know that. And yeah. so one thing I really try to help people see is that there's not just A and B. There's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I don't know what, you know, we just have to be able to open the aperture enough to see through whatever fog we're sitting in, in the moment. And I think that sometimes seeing through that fog is really like, again, it's just challenging to do on your own. So if you're feeling stuck, it's like, you know, it's like, that's when you need to pick up the phone. When you feel the least like doing it, it's like, again, going to that path of most resistance, the thing that you're most resistant to just pick one thing, you know, do something, do something different. Yeah. I'm a sailor from way back. Um, I love sailing. I've always loved sailing. I will always love sailing. Um, But there were days when the fog would roll in Mm. and it was really very frightening at times because people can't see you on your on the boat, right? They, they, but before you know it, they're on top of you. And sometimes big yeah. ships come by and small ships come by and canoes come by and kayaks come by any number of different vessels along with whales and seals and marvelous things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. However, 
you know, one of the things I don't want people to feel when they're thinking about fog is that fog itself means just to be stuck, right? Because mm -hmm. fog itself is beautiful. If you pay attention to the fog, just mm -hmm. to be present in the fog, it's millions and millions and millions of tiny water droplets mm. that are coming through you. If you stop and listen to the sounds of the fog, Mm -hmm. And then start listening for the sound of the mast shaking. And you start listening to the sound of the buoy in the water and the steels coming up and the different noises. It's actually not as deafening as we right. think it is. And so I invite beautiful you analogy. to kind of go, wait a second now, even the fog mm -hmm. is not necessarily paralyzing, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. just that right now, you know, it's sort of like, like I read a book once that had a, it was years ago and it was a great, great book. I just wish I knew the name of it so I could share it or, or I would, but it basically started off. It was a picture book for children and it started off mm. on the front cover of being up at the sky and in the stars. And then it broke down all the stars and then it went down to the next layer and the next layer and the next layer, mm -hmm. next layer, next Thank layer, you. next layer, all the way down until it found a child sitting on the floor with a toy. Right? right, like all of this big stuff. And so I'm, I'm just thinking it's when we're thinking about mm -hmm. coaching and we're thinking about yoga and we're thinking about revolution and we're thinking about change and we're thinking mm -hmm. about all of those things, the experience isn't in the end result. The experience is in the moment along the way to your mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when you're talking about the layering, yeah, I would say coaching is actually more about unlearning than it's about learning. Interesting. Like it's just this thing we've been conditioned to operate a certain way. You know, like yeah. when I think about my resentment, that is something that I had modeled for me, you yes. know, and not consciously and not maliciously, you know. No, no, no. And Absolutely. right. So it's just something I kind of absorbed. Mm -hmm. And as a coach, I always challenge people to ask themselves if they believe in the values that they're practicing anymore. Some of them are just inherited and we're practicing these things yes. that are from our parents or our grandparents or our community. And you can start to feel when things start feeling unaligned, right? There's some kind of rub. You're like, mm, this just feels awkward when I say things like this or I do that. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes we don't know why. And yeah. often it's just like, we're practicing something that we were taught that we just no longer believe in. Yes. You know? Yes. And as a mom, it's hard to watch that happen. <laughs> as a child, I actually have an easier time. But as a mom, I'm like, no, no, I taught you this. It's the right I know. way. I know. And it's just a way, you know, it's just a, a, one way. Yeah. And so, yeah, just be unlearning. I, I'm, I, I hear you. And I especially am, re am resonating with it because I'm a grandmother now. I have two beautiful mm -hmm. grandchildren. And it's like, oh, honey, I didn't mean to teach you that shaka. Like, I did not want to teach you that. Right. I'm surprised that that came out. And, oh, please, please don't pass that along, right? Because, mm -hmm. it's a key, and it, not, not in a bad way, but to be delighted mm -hmm. in the fact that there's always more one way to do things than there mm -hmm. are just to stay on that very, you know, we're dynamic people. Yeah. It's not a static world that we live in. It changes. Yeah, in, um, absolutely. We're coming very near the end of our program. I hate it when it happens, especially when it's a conversation. <laughs> it's really nice. It has. It's been really good. And I hope for our listeners, it's been educational and that people are going to really think about taking some risks that they wouldn't otherwise take. You know, mm -hmm. try and step outside of your comfort zone and, and get the help mm -hmm. that you need by someone like yourself who can really mm -hmm. help support that process. So Kathy Skelter, thank you for being on the program. We are not done yet, but I want people to use their pen and paper before we go down mm -hmm. the next road. So can you share with our audience, how do people find you? How do people reach you? Um, probably the easiest way is my website, which is just kathyskelter.com. So C A T H Y. Yay. S K S K E L C H E R dot com. And um, on there you can go to my women's health coaching page uh, or my contact information. You can call me, you can text me, you can email me. I'm available through all of those. Um, Facebook and a uh, Facebook, I'm inner revolution coaching and yoga, and Instagram, I'm just Kathy Skelter. So all of those, all of those things. Please use them. I, you know, I hope that everyone who's been listening takes a chance and just does it, mm. checks in and make sure that they follow up and find you.
Yeah. As I said, it is my favorite part of the program though. And at this time in yes. the conversation, it's like, you know, there's a, we've, we've unpacked a lot of stuff today. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that make women are wonderful, unique, bodacious, incredibly lovely people. Mm-hmm. If you could invite someone on community with the world, with yourself, with, you know, colleagues, friends, however, what might that look like for you? If I could, can you ask that question again? If I could, yeah, if you could, if you could share with our community or imbibe okay. something from, from your learning experiences, what might that look yes. like for you? I think it comes back to the village. Yeah. It's like build your village and take one step. So, you know, if build your village consciously, be very careful about who you invite into it and be and do one thing. So it's like, find the simplest thing. If you're struggling right now, if you're having a hard time, if you're feeling overwhelmed, what is one thing that is within your power to change? And it can be as simple as, you know, calling your friend and booking, you know, a walk once a week uh, so that you can debrief and get some fresh air. It can be literally, you know, locking the door and having a bath by yourself. It does, it does not have to be expensive. Um, you know, it might be, it might be hiring a coach. It might be something bigger. So just do one thing that's within your power to change. I think that's incredibly good advice because one thing, one little bit at a time can be over time, like a really big deal. Like, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much again for being with us today. It has just been such a pleasure to have you. And I'm, I'm just so delighted that we get to uh, take some of your wisdom and, uh, and share it with the universe. Yeah, thank, you. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Once again, ladies and gents, Kathy Skelter, you can find her on her website, Inner Revolution Coaching and Yoga. She did mention that she's all over Facebook and all over the Instagram and all the media, special media stuff. And if you are watching this on YouTube, there will be a link uh, below in the chat box. So thank you again for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad that you came today. Thanks a bunch. Uh, We are looking forward to bringing out our next episode of Act 3 on Shaw. Uh, Please make sure you tune into Shaw Cable 4. You never know what you're going to find on Act 3 or who you're going to talk to or what you're going to meet or what you're going to see or listen to. So we're super glad that every time you join us, it is a privilege for us to be able to be here for you in community. I'm Kathy Holmes. I'm your host. Thanks again. Have a great day, everybody.